Hello, and welcome to another edition of Incremental Doom. Tonight, we begin a four-part tale of decadent aristocrats with more than a dash of deviance. Rivalry, covetousness, treachery, sorcery, unnatural occurrences. Let's observe the gnarled origin of these nobles in... The Infernal History of the Ivy Bridge Twins by Molly Tanzer Part 1 Concerning the Life and Death of St. John Fitzroy, Lord Calipash The Suffering of the Lady Calipash The Unsavory Endeavors of Lord Calipash's Cousin, Mr. Vilan As well as an account of the curious circumstances surrounding the birth of the future Lord Calipash and his twin sister. In the county of Devonshire, in the parish of Ivybridge, stood the ancestral home of the Lord's Calipash. Calipash Manor was large, built sturdily of the local limestone, and had stood for many years without fire or other catastrophe marring its expanse. No one could impugn the size and antiquity of the house. Yet often one or another of those among Lord Calipash's acquaintance might be heard to comment that the manor had a rather rambling, hodgepodge look to it, and this could not be easily refuted without the peril of speaking a falsehood. The reason for this was that the Lord's Calipash had always been the very essence of English patriotism, and rather than ever tearing down any part of the house and building anew, each Lord Calipash had chosen to make additions and improvements to older structures. Thus, though the prospect was somewhat sprawling, it served as a pleasant enough reminder of the various styles of Devonian architecture and became something of a local attraction. St. John Fitzroy, Lord Calipash, was a handsome man, tall, fair-haired, and blue-eyed. He had been bred up as any gentleman of rank and fortune might be, and therefore the manner of his death was more singular than any aspect of his life. Now, given that this is, indeed, an infernal history, the sad circumstances surrounding this good man's unexpected and early demise demand attention by the narrator, and they are inextricably linked with the Lord Calipash's cousin, a young scholar called Mr. Vilan, who will figure more prominently in this narrative than his nobler relation. Mr. Vilan came to stay at Calipash Manor during the Seven Years' War, in order to prevent his being conscripted into the French army. Though indifference had previously characterized the relationship between Lord Calipash and Mr. Vilan, Mr. Vilan belonging to a significantly lower branch of the family tree, when Mr. Vilan wrote to Lord Calipash to beg sanctuary, the good Lord would not deny his own flesh and blood. This was not to say, however, that Lord Calipash was above subtly encouraging his own flesh and blood to make his stay a short one. And to that end, he gave Mr. Vilan the tower bedroom that had been built by one of the more eccentric lords some generations prior to our tale, who so enjoyed pretending to be the Lady Jane Grey that he had the edifice constructed so that his wife could dress up as a member of the Privy Council and keep him locked up there for as long as nine days at a stretch. But that was not the reason Lord Calipash bade his cousin reside there. The tower was a drafty place, and given to dampness, and thus seemed certain of securing Mr. Vilan's speedy departure. As it turns out, however, the two men were so unlike one another, that what Lord Calipash thought was an insulting situation, Mr. Vilan found entirely salubrious, and so, happily, out of a case of simple misunderstanding, grew an affection founded on deepest admiration for Mr. Vilan's part, and for Lord Calipash's enjoyment, of toadying. All the long years of the international conflict, Mr. Vilan remained at Calipash Manor, and with the passing of each and every day, he came more into the confidence of Lord Calipash, until it was not an uncommon occurrence to hear members of Lord Calipash's circle using words like inseparable to describe their relationship. Then, only six months before the signing of the Treaty of Paris, the possibility of continued fellowship between Lord Calipash and Mr. Vilan was quite suddenly extinguished. A Mr. Fellingworth moved into the neighborhood with his family, among them his daughter of 15 years, Miss Alice Fellingworth. 
dark of hair and eye, but pale of cheek, her beauty did not go long unnoticed by the local swains. She had many suitors and many offers, but from among a nosegay of sparks, she chose as her favorite blossom the Lord Calipash. Mr. Velan had also been among Miss Fellingworth's admirers, and her decision wounded him. Not so much that he refused to come to the wedding, he was very fond of cake, but certainly enough that all the love that Mr. Velan had felt for Lord Calipash was instantly converted, as if by alchemy, to pure hatred. In his dollar, Mr. Velan managed to convince himself that Miss Fellingworth's father had pressured her to accept Lord Calipash's offer for the sake of his rank and income, against her true inclinations. That had she been allowed to pick her heart's choice, she certainly would have accepted Mr. Velan's suit rather than his cousin's. Such notions occupied Mr. Velan's thoughts whenever he saw the happy couple together, and every day his mind became more and more inhospitable to any pleasure he might have otherwise felt on account of his friend's newfound felicity. A listener of this history might well wonder why Mr. Velan did not quit Calipash Manor, given that his situation, previously so agreeable, he now found intolerable. Mr. Velan was, however, loath to leave England. He had received a letter from his sister informing him that, during his absence, his modest home had been commandeered by the army, and thus his furniture was in want of replacing, his lands trampled without hope of harvest, his stores pilfered, and, perhaps worst of all, his wretched sister was with child by an Austrian soldier who had, it seemed, lied about his interest in playing the role of father beyond the few minutes required to grant him that status. It seemed prudent to Mr. Velan to keep apart from such appalling circumstances for as long as possible. Then, one evening, from the window of his tower bedroom, Mr. Velan saw Lord Calipash partaking of certain marital pleasures with the new Lady Calipash against a tree in one of the gardens. Nauseated, Mr. Velan called for his servant and announced his determination to secretly leave Calipash Manor once and for all early the following morning. While the servant packed his bags and trunks, Mr. Velan penned a letter explaining his hasty departure to Lord Calipash, and left it, along with a token of remembrance, in Lord Calipash's study. Quite early the next morning, just as he was securing his cravat, Mr. Velan was treated to the unexpected but tantalizing sight of Lady Calipash in Dejabi. She was beside herself with grief, but eventually Mr. Velan, entirely sympathetic and eager to understand the source of her woe, coaxed the story from her fevered mind. I woke early, quite cold, gibbered Lady Calipash. Lord Calipash had never come to bed, though he promised me when I went up that he should follow me after settling a few accounts. When I discovered him absent, I rose and sought him in his study, only to find him dead. Oh, it was too terrible. His eyes were open, wide and round and staring. At first I thought it looked very much like he had been badly frightened. But then I thought he had almost a look of... of... ecstasy about him. I believe... Here the Lady Calipash faltered, and it took some minutes for Mr. Velan to get the rest of the story from her, for her agitated state required his fetching smelling salts from out of his valise. Eventually she calmed enough to relate the following. I believe he might have done himself the injury that took him from me, she sobbed. His wrists were slit, and next to him lay his letter opener. He, he had used his own blood to scrawl a message on the skirting boards. Oh, Mr. Velan. What did the message say? asked Mr. Velan. It said, he is calling. He is calling. I hear him, she said, and then she hesitated. What is it, Lady Calipash? asked Mr. Velan. I cannot see its importance, but he had this in his other hand, said she, and handed to Mr. Velan a small object wrapped in a handkerchief. He took it from her and saw that it was an odd bit of ivory, wrought to look like a lad's head crowned with laurel. Mr. Velan put it in his pocket and smiled at the Lady Calipash. 
Likely it has nothing to do with your husband's tragic end, he said gently. I purchased this whilst in Greece, and the late Lord Calapash had often admired it. I gave it to him as a parting gift, for I had meant to withdraw from Calapash Manor this very morning. Oh, but you mustn't, begged Lady Calapash. Not now, not after. Lord Calapash would wish you to be here. You mustn't go just now, please, for my sake. Mr. Velan would have been happy to remain on those terms, had the Lady Calapash finished speaking. Alas, there was one piece of information she had yet to relate. And for our child's sake as well, she concluded. While the Lord Calapash's final message was being scrubbed from the skirting boards, and his death was being declared an accident by the constable, in order that the departed lord might be buried in the churchyard, Mr. Velan violently interrogated Lady Calapash's serving maid. The story was true. The lady was indeed expecting. And this intelligence displeased Mr. Velan so immensely that, even as he made himself pleasant and helpful with the hope that he might eventually win the Lady Calapash's affections, he sought to find a method of ridding her of her unborn child. To Mr. Velan's mind, Lady Calapash could not but fall in love with her loyal confidant, believing as he did that she had always secretly admired him. But Mr. Vila knew that should she bear the late Lord Calapash's son, the estate would one day be entirely lost to him. Thus, he dosed the lady with recipes born of his own researches. For while Mr. Vila's current profession was that of scholar, in his youth, he had pursued lines of study related to all manner of black magics and sorceries. For many years, he had put aside his wicked thaumaturgy, being too happy in the company of Lord Calapash to travel those paths that demand solitude and gloom and suffering. But, newly motivated, he returned to his former interests with a desperate passion. Like the wife of Bath, Mr. Vila knew all manner of remedies for love's mischances, and he put wicked spells on the decoctions and tisans that he prepared to help his cause. Yet, despite Mr. Vilan's skill with infusion and incantation, Lady Calapash grew heavy with child. Indeed, she had such a healthy maternal glow about her that the doctor exclaimed for one so young to be brought to childbed, she was certain of a healthy accouchement. Mr. Vilan, as canny an adept at lying as other arts, appeared to be thrilled by his lady's prospects and was every day by her side. Though privately discouraged by her salutary condition, he was cheered by all manner of odd portents that he observed as her lying in drew ever closer. First, a murder of large, evil-looking ravens took up residence upon the roof of Calapash Manor, cackling and cawing day and night. Then, the ivy growing on Calapash Manor's aged walls turned from green to scarlet a circumstance no naturalist in the area could satisfactorily explain. Third, though the Lady Calapash's delivery was expected in midwinter, a she-goat was found to be unexpectedly in the same delicate condition as her mistress, and gave birth to a two-headed kid that was promptly beaten to death and buried far from the manor. Not long after that unhappy parturition, which had disturbed the residents of Calapash Manor so greatly that the news was kept from Lady Calapash for fear of doing her or her unborn child a mischief, the lady began to feel the pangs of her own travail. At the very stroke of midnight, on the night of the dark of the moon, during a lightning storm that was as out of season as the she-goat's unusual kid, the Lady Calapash was happy to give birth to a healthy baby boy, the future Lord Calapash and as surprised as the midwife, when a second child followed, an equally plump and squalling girl. They were so alike that Lady Calapash named them Basil and Rosemary, and then promptly gave them over to the wet nurse to be washed and fed. The wet nurse was a stout woman from the village, good-natured and well-intentioned, but a sounder sleeper than was wanted in that house. Though an infant's wail would rouse her in an instant, Footfalls masked by thunder were too subtle for her country-bred ear, 
and thus she did not observe the solitary figure that stole silently into the nursery in the wee hours of that morning. For only a few moments did the individual linger, knowing well how restive infants can be in their first hours of life. By the eldritch glow of a lightning strike, Mr. Velan uncorked a vial containing the blood of the two-headed kid now buried, and he smeared upon both of those rosy foreheads an unholy mark, which, before the next burst of thunder, sank without a trace into their soft and delicate skin. For additional tales of literary horror to unsettle you, click the subscribe button below. Incremental Doom. Exponential Entertainment. I'm Edgar.